Welcome to Celebrating Act 2. Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life. Welcome to another episode of Celebrating Act 2, where John Coleman and I get to speak with Michelle Fabrica, our love and relationship coach, who will solve all of our problems in relationships. <laughs> No Yikes. Pressure. <laughs> no, no pressure, pressure Michelle. No pressure. Right. <laughs> Solve the world's problems. Hey, I speaking of solving the world's problems, I read an article. I, it was uh, probably in a waiting room somewhere. And it, I don't know how old the magazine was, but I got the impression um, that this was a really old concept. And it was about power sharing in a relationship. I don't remember the name of the magazine or the article, but it was, the idea was that um, a man and a woman have a relationship and and there's a pow always a power struggle there. And I thought to myself as I read this, isn't this kind of a, I don't know, an old 1960s concept of, uh, of uh, femininity or whatever it is? It, it, it seemed like an out, a really out of date idea. Is that still, people still discuss this, the power sharing in a relationship? Um. Yeah, we're going to discuss it today, actually, because I think it's actually important to bring it around because I think you're right. I mean, there used to be a certain dynamic in a relationship, you know, 50s, uh, 60s, uh, you know, the way a relationship would go. And I think that one of the things I see regularly in, um, in a relationship in trouble is that one person has more power in the relationship than the other. And essentially what I mean by that is that one person's needs are often regularly put first. And so it's sort of like the squeaky wheel gets the grease, right? So the person who is, and you know, pardon the, um, the labels here or whatever, but like the person who might be more volatile or delicate, emotional, demanding, confident or outspoken, that's the one whose needs are often attended to first. And I think that when we put, you know, one person's choices above the other, um, it, it, it's a dynamic that actually, um, you know, seems like it, oh, this is great. You know, one person is willing to compromise first and, you know, I'm more easygoing and that's fine. I don't mind this dynamic, but often what it comes down to underneath there is that person is less comfortable with conflict. Mm -hmm. And so they're willing to let things go. And so even though it might seem, oh, this is a match made in heaven, you know, he's easygoing and she has more, you know, demands or whatever and more controlling. But this um, this pattern can really become entrenched. Mm, you know, it's kind of interesting when John first brought up the subject and uh, Michelle, you bring up some really interesting uh, thoughts about the dynamics between people. Uh, I, I, I thought that maybe he was reading a, a popular mechanics in the 1950s. Uh, when uh, uh, men were the primary breadwinner outside the house uh, yeah. and uh, control the money and therefore uh, control, at least that's what jumped in the back of my mind uh, and then would control a lot of the things going around the house. But at today's day and age, when uh, uh, sometimes uh, the, the primary breadwinner is the, uh, in a traditional mar marriage, the, uh, the, the mom, and uh, or, or the the wife and the husband is a perhaps even a stay at home mom. It, perhaps that might have shifted, but I, I guess even in those days, there always was, uh, as you say, the strength of character, uh, the forcefulness with which they entered the relationship, and so it's not always just uh, who was the primary breadwinner, but it uh, goes far beyond that. But today, I think that probably. As much as it was uh, the man who would be controlling, it could just as easily be uh, the, uh, the 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 wife or the woman in the, in the relationship oh, oh, because of the finance. Oh, because of finances, absolutely. yeah, absolutely. I um, a few years ago uh, worked with a guy who was a doormat for his wife. I mean, he this guy was is nice guy. He didn't seem to be particularly a milk toast personality. But I have to tell you, over a period of a year, we could all his coworkers could see that she just walked all over him. He had he he did whatever she needed, mm. and he did it right away. And it wasn't because he loved her; it was because there there was a pretty minor level 
but it was still it felt to the rest of us like emotional abuse. So anyway, Michelle, yeah, irrespective I, 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 of the irrespective of the reason, okay, how can a couple address this? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I think, John, that's exactly what I wanted to say is that often we've been around people where we've seen this dynamic. And of course, you know, we never really know what's going on inside someone else's relationship, but we can have, we often have a hunch, right? And it starts to look like one person's like the star and the other person's the sidekick or the handler even, <laughs> right? Or personal yeah. assistant. And it's kind yeah. of painful and awkward and embarrassing to be around. And um, so th what I want to invite uh, a, a couple to do is that, you know, is this dynamic present in my current relationship? And if you're single, you know, take a look at past relationships. And I encourage you to look honestly at this and be willing to hear what your partner has to say, because um, this relation, the whole point of a relationship, right, is to meet the needs of the people in the relationship. Sure. So, um, you know, it's not easy to bring up and, um, you know, to look at basically, but how do we handle conflicts as a couple? And I mean, like to have like a meta conversation about it. We're not talking about specific. This is not a let's solve all our you know conflict showdown or something like that. But you know, not all conflicts are meant to be solved, and that's okay. But a couple can really learn to manage conflicts better and allowing differences and 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 for, you know in each person's individuality. Yeah, yeah, hmm. it's a good point, and it's not. We're not talking about uh, who should do the dishes. You know, you you need to do the dishes because I'm doing the cooking. It's not about that. It's really, uh, I think about, I, I call it sharing all the yeah. responsibilities in a relationship. And it's not, I don't mean the physical chores of a relationship as much as it is the, the sharing of, I guess, power is a good word, you know, yeah, Who decision making, decisions. right? The choice is mm. right, right. Sure. And even, I mean, I would say all those things also, you know, it's like, are we expecting our partner to do certain things? Are we, you know, making demands of them? Do they right. have to come with us when we go visit, you know, you know, our parents or our kids, all the, you know, whatever, like, are we requiring that other person to do or be something that yeah. is like really very selfish in a way, not, you know, we're trying to manage someone else's and we did another topic on this, right. About, you know, individual sovereignty in a relationship. And do I have, you know, kind of choices about my own, you know, where I want to be, how I want to spend my time or is what my partner just like, you know, they're the boss of me, you know, it's like, that's not a healthy dynamic that's going to be sustainable. And yeah. if you're in a relationship where you see, you know, you're in this dynamic and you feel one down and your partner's one up, that's a great place to, to reach out to get some support either individually or as a couple, because it's not something that's going to go away. And oftentimes it gets even more entrenched. It's mm -hmm. a worthy investment. Good point. I also liked, Michelle, the way you brought up uh, a minute ago, um, if you're single. Because oftentimes these kinds of relationship, I'll call it a problem, um, develop when you're dating. And you, that's right. you, you know, you're in madly in love and you just, then you end up getting married or living together. And before you know it, all of a sudden, all those things that you were kind of willing to put up with when you were dating are now a big problem because you're in a long-term relationship and it you're being trampled on, you know? Mm. Yeah. And if you have that susceptibility from relationships, when you look back, I would say that's a good time to get support on it before you're even in a relationship. Like, yeah. how can I learn to advocate for myself more, even in the, you know, when you're in other relationships at work or with friends or whatever, it's like, you know, how can we build that muscle for more, you know, autonomy and expression of like, this is what I need. And that's not going to work for me. It's one of my yeah. favorite phrases that doesn't work for me. Yeah. I mean, I shouldn't say my favorite phrase. It's a phrase to use. that's not blaming, but you know, some situation or pattern or dynamic, it's not working for me and invite yeah. people to use their voice around that. I, sus I suspect that the, um, especially uh, earlier in a relationship, as, as John, as you indicated, probably it starts well into the dating part where people establish their their superiority or inferiority, that that's something that's really hard for the person on the inferior side of the relationship to be able to express themselves. So uh, they probably 
if they're ever going to get out of it, are going to need some professional help. And uh, the question is, is the person who has the the commandeering, the demanding or, uh, or superior role, if you will, in the relationship, uh, is that something that they feel they have to do in order for the relationship to work at all? So a lot of dynamics here that we're probably well unqualified to address, whereas somebody like yourself sitting down with the two people and finding out what is it the relationship that makes you this way, or do you even realize you're doing that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Or did you just yeah. become a did, did you become a doormat and there's not and, and you feel helpless, and uh, if you don't have somebody to to find out from that other partner to help that discussion, uh, I I don't know that this is something people can solve by themselves. Well, that, Michelle, that brings up a a question I have for you, and that is, how hard is it? for most people, I, I don't know what the average is, but how hard is it for most people to see their side of it? In other words, to recognize that they're either dominating or being dominated, mm. not in a good way. Mm, yeah, I, th I mean, I think it obviously depends. I think oftentimes it's the person who is used to kind of getting their way. It's like, I don't understand that things are working fine. Like it's always work. It, it works fine for me, but what it is is that it works fine for them, but not so great for their partner. So they have to be willing to, you know, really, you know, look in the mirror and see how it impacts the other person. I think that's all, you know, that's what relating is really all about. Can we see and notice how we are impacting the other person and can we be willing to be affected by that? Yeah. And, and and care, you know, so, um, yeah, I invite people to really, you know, be take an honest look at, yeah. at you know, one's own behaviors. Well, another good another great example of why people need a love and relationship coach, OK, to help them sort through it, because a lot of these things you just can't do by yourself. But somebody yeah. who has your skill set, which is why we always appreciate your your take on these things, is that. There are different sides and maybe just having somebody who is not a proponent of one side or the other, but is a advocate for the marriage or the relationship, which is what you are, can help people understand what they're doing. They may not even realize that they are doing that or they may have to have that in their life. And maybe there's no change or maybe there's some compromise, but they're not going to work it out by themselves. They need they need somebody like yourself. Yeah, I think it's important to have. I, I have compassion for both sides of the dynamic, and um, and it can be can be resolved. Hmm. Well, thank you, Michelle. Again, uh, uh, just a fascinating conversation, and uh, nice to have you around. For more on celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage. Follow us on Facebook. Subscribe to us on YouTube. And tell your friends, Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life.